As we continue our exploration of the South Carolina Voucher Program, our next conversation shifts the spotlight to the positive aspects of this initiative. Joining us is Shaka Mitchell, Senior Fellow of the American Federation for Children. Shaka, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So we, this law has been trying to be passed for about two decades now. Yeah. Um, why did it break through? Yeah, I think it broke through for a number of reasons. Um, one of the main reasons that we see sort of educational choice or educational freedom, as some people call it, mm -hmm. breaking through was really COVID, right? Okay. I mean, when COVID hit, I think about my own family, and all of a sudden, my daughters were at home, and we were just trying to figure out how to make it work, and I think mm -hmm. lots of parents across the country were in a similar situation, and, yeah. and many parents kind of had more of a glimpse into their child's school day, and they yeah. said, you know, maybe this isn't working as well as I thought it was. Mm -hmm. We need some more options. So I think that's a main reason. Also, technology has, has really made things different. Mm -hmm. um, so as compared to, say, when I was a kid, you know, you can now do education in a number of different sort of settings. So mm -hmm. like you do some in person, you do some online, kind of hybrid learning, mm -hmm. and those possibilities have really opened things up for families. Mm -hmm. And now can you provide an overview of this expansion that, that is being potentially implemented to yeah. this law? Sure, so last year, the South Carolina uh, General Assembly passed the Education um, Scholarship Trust Fund mm -hmm. Act, right? And so there's this program that allows 5,000 students, um, lower income students, to take the state dollars and use them in the educational setting of their choice. Okay. This year's proposal would expand that program and kind of tweak it a little bit. Okay. And um, so it would allow more students to have more access over time. Mm -hmm. And now what do you think are the most beneficial aspects of, of having this, this educational choice and being able to have this scholarship money and yeah. being able to use it, kind of putting it in the parent's choice. Yeah, I think the most beneficial um, sort of components that you see with any choice program, and these exist, by the way, in now 14 states mm -hmm. around the country, um, but really if you talk to families, they know all it takes is knowing two children and you know that children are not created um, equal. Yeah. And so the question is, do we think one school system can account for, in the state of South Carolina, say, 800,000 different little learners? Probably not. And so families just need different options. And yeah. so it's really a way to kind of customize the education for the specific child. Mm -hmm. And Ashaka, what would you say, um, you know, people are worried that this is really going to have a negative effect on, on public schooling. Mm. Um, what would you say to that? Yeah, I, I think I would point to two things. Mm. Um, one is South Carolina should look to other states because as I mentioned, um, several other states have already passed programs like this and we don't see um, like the demise of local public schools. Mm -hmm. At the American Federation for Children, we're really agnostic as to what type of school you choose. So mm -hmm. if, a, if your zone school is working for you, then great, like yeah. that's awesome. If you need a different setting though, we think you should have the, the right to be able to choose that. Mm -hmm. But right now I think a lot of families kind of feel stuck um, and that's, a, that's an awful feeling as a parent. If you just feel like you're sending your child into an environment that's not working for them. Yeah. yeah. And I feel like, you know, educational choice, you know, COVID has changed a lot, but that was kind of looked at as a privilege or something that was um, more met by, you know, medium income to, to upper class. Yeah. But now it is being favored by all communities. Yeah. Do you yeah. have any statistics to, to back that? Yeah, I think you're totally right. So, you know, in some ways, educational choice has always existed, mm -hmm. right? It's existed for people who can afford it, and you either afford to pay tuition, and you know, you come out of pocket and you pay the money for it, yeah. or if you can afford to move to a, a better neighborhood with better public schools. Mm -hmm. So it's always existed, just not for everybody. So the question is, how do you expand access? One of the things we're seeing right now, a national poll just came out that said 73% of black families favor being able to use tax dollars to attend the public or private school of their choice. Mm -hmm. So um, it's not just, say, your traditionally kind of um, wealthy families, but now you're seeing families from historically underrepresented and underserved communities that are accessing these programs and want to have a choice. Yeah. yeah. And now where can our viewers go to keep up with the American Federation for Children? Yeah, so you can visit our website. It's um, federationforchildren.org. Um, I would also encourage your viewers, you know, if you want to apply for the, the South Carolina Education Scholarship Trust Fund program, visit um, sc.gov. Mm -hmm. um, 
the deadline to do that is March 15th, so it's coming up really quickly. Yeah, wonderful. Well, Shaka, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah. We're back after this.